of whey, uh, whey protein, so all the essential amino acids. The body needs all the essential amino acids to synthesize proteins. You should not take half of the, or a third of the essential amino acids. It makes no sense. I mean, it's good flavoring for the water, if that's what you care about. Pretty expensive flavoring, but in my humble opinion, uh, you're much better off with whey protein than you are with the uh, BCAAs. I had a question for you guys, just to get feedback. When, it, for me anyway, taking on a new client, the, the biggest struggle for the, the type of client and the point of working with them is when you're first taking on a brand new client who's never worked with a coach, they've never had to answer some of the questions on like an intake or an interview that you're asking, and they're not even that aware to some of their own sensitivities or reactions or adaptations. And so you're trying to discern where they start at, what's gonna work well, what might not, or what you're working with but they don't know if they respond well to carbohydrates or fat, or they're not even that in tune to reactions to volume or intensity or, or overtraining. When, and let's say they've got good to maybe above average potential to compete, and you know that you wanna work with them, they're, they're ready to go. How can you accelerate or get better insights earlier on to know where that person's at if what you're working with is very shallow to find out where they're at and where, where they need to be? Yeah, so, man, that's a lot. Uh, great question, though. And a lot of this, this isn't an easy way out, but a lot of this is just done through experience issues and eyes from over the years of being able to at least get an idea of where. I, I've got an email that I just started somewhere. His name's Anthony. He's like, hey, I want to know how you got to my starting protein, carbs, and fats. But a lot of it's just over the years I've been able to, what I have someone do is like track their food. I won't work with someone if they won't track their food. Like, if I have no idea what they're eating, to, I'm to the point, I'm like, listen, I, there's other coaches that will that will do it all for you, but I won't. Like, you've got to track your food, send it to me three days worth, and then at least I know their calories. I can break down their protein, carbs, and fats. At least it gives me an idea of what their body's to, used to, and then I find out through a questionnaire, I'm like, have you been dieting over the last year? What's that look like? What were your calories? How much weight did you lose? All these different things that tell me, you know, if someone comes to me and needs to lose 30 pounds, they want to be eating 1,100 calories, I know I'm not going to start this girl off on 2,200 calories and she gains a bunch of weight she's pissed. So a lot of it's data collection over the years. And then once I see that, I, I generally start most people at a protein range as far as females because it, it's pretty easy to start somebody there. And then most people, I'll have them, you know, females, I like to have them at least eat 50 grams of fat a day and I'll start them there. And the rest of their calories are made up from carbs. And that's just for me to watch and see how they respond to moderate to high protein, moderate fat, which is 50 grams a day, and the rest made up in carbs. So maybe a girl's eating 150 protein, 200 carbs, 50 grams of fat a day, and I just watch with no cheating, and I watch and I adjust from there. If someone's gaining weight rapidly, they haven't, they haven't been eating much at all. Some people will drop really fast. I'm like, you know what, you respond to carbs just fine. So a lot of that's just kind of done over the years, and what I do is I start somebody and then I just watch and I adapt. I mean, it's literally that easy. I don't, if there was a formula, if this was a math equation, if this was as easy, I said this last year, if this was easy and it was just math, I'd pull my shirt up and have six pack abs because I just have the exact perfect scenario and I would cut this exact amount of calories and lose 0.5 grams of fat a week, you know, 0.5 pounds, that's what I'm saying. Like, a lot of this just comes to, it's an art form. Like, what we do coaching-wise, yeah, I just want to quickly add that I think people get way too paralyzed with having the perfect starting program. And the beauty in a plan is it's the adjustments that you make along the way. Nobody, nobody up here on this stage can look at every one of you and give you the perfect plan, even based on a thorough questionnaire. Again, the beauty is going to be in your eye and what you see, the data you get back from it, the adjustments that you make. That's what's going to get them there. It's not the perfect plan. So. I just wouldn't be overly obsessive about that. Just what we say is get in the ball game. Just get them in the ball game, get a movement, and then you get adjust as you go. <laughs> I even tell my clients, hey, this is going to be a trial and error at first. You know, I'm going to start you at this amount based on what you told me in the questionnaire, but it could change three days from now. It could change in a week. It could change, and I just tell them that up front. So... I'm going to come from questions and how long to buy the rest of the First of all, they were talking about earlier uh, with, um, with the intermittent fasting, Rodney was saying 
uh, maybe at least take in like protein or stuff like that. So would you recommend like doing like more like a protein, a general say protein and, and do the protein, but do a carb and fat fasting? Like if so there's somebody that wants to do it and then fasting is like this and make sure that there's at least drinking like a protein shake or something like that under like left every four hours or something instead of you know, would you recommend that? And um, so that's all the questions first if you want to Actually, it's one separately. If I understood it correctly. So, um, you know, if you go back to like a couple of my slides, you know, and um, you know, once you identify your, your daily protein target, um, and then you, you drop it down into where, where that protein falls, if you want to do intermittent fasting on top of that, that's, you know, that's your, you know, that's your thing. In my view, the intermittent fasting, you're fasting on, you know, basically carbon fat, not necessarily protein. So still maintain, you know, my recommended, you know, what I would suggest is, I guess I, I think you're going to be able to get there as easily, if not easier, and get maybe better results from a body composition standpoint, if you go ahead and you maintain that protein schedule. And maybe those proteins are excess, you know, very, very lean. Maybe they're in supplement form at that point. Um, you know, maybe it's, you know, like even a whey protein isolate, uh, you know, 25 grams, 20 grams, 25 grams, whatever it is, 100 calories. But it's, you know, it's, it's like 96% of that is going to come from protein. So it, it's, it's very concentrated protein. So, I mean, that's, that's what I was saying that, you know, just continue your protein regimen over the waking hours. Maintain the anabolic stimulus, and then if, if you you know if somebody wants to do the intermittent fasting, the protein still continues. Then they just layer in the other macronutrients during that more succinct time period. If I answered that question correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I tried to, I let, me, let me add one more thing yeah. for you too, because number one, obviously that's fasting, but number two, what Rob was talking about is what many of the top bodybuilders do to get in great shape. They put more of their carbohydrates around their training to be used as fuel and recover glycogen, and the other meals are lower carbohydrates. So this isn't like some new type of fasting. This is what many, many, a very high percentage of bodybuilders do to get in great shape. They center those carbs for training, to train hard, and then the periods of time that are away from training, they fat. That's not fasting, that's just, I think that's just like a standard way, wouldn't you say, John, Jason, that's just a standard way that, that's high level bodybuilding. Is really what that is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree with that. I just want to say everyone fasts. So if you're waiting three hours between your meal, you're having a three-hour fast. So really, yeah, it comes down to what the extent of the fast is. And really, that is what needs to be clarified, and that's what really is up in the air. So just a point of note. Yeah. I, I did that 16 day for a while. some of this on, you know, the research that's been done, um, you know, with 50 plus, 65 and older or something like that, just, it, you know, it's just the inclusion exclusion criteria of an experimental design. But I, I do think that the research, you know, is suggesting that for, you know, the general population or people who are not habitually trained and, you know, you know, um, you know they're, they're used to higher protein intakes and so forth, you know, they do tend to um, require a little bit more protein. Um, and, you know, I've seen some pretty high recommendations, uh, you know, anywhere from 1.2 to 1.4 to even 1.5 grams per kilo for people who are over the age of 50 and 60 plus and so forth. So, you know, like I was saying earlier, it just doesn't, you know, oh, I'm 50, I need more protein. You know, I, I think that it, it, um, it probably, happens over time, and I think it's probably, some of it is directly related to, um, you know, the reduced mechanical stimulus on skeletal muscle, you know, as we get older. We just don't, 
we don't challenge our muscle, you know, and, and this is for generally inactive people. So to apply to individuals who, you know, who spend their lives training hard and so forth, I, I, I think there's a lot of unknowns there as well. And I think we're just starting to look at some of the data in that area that maybe it's not as significant for somebody who, you know, who uh, has conditioned, trained muscle and has been doing it for a long period of time that maybe the need isn't as high as it would be for somebody who is untrained who begins training older or you know or you're just trying to match up you know the anabolic stimulus of just a protein meal so you know i think that there's there's a, a little bit there as well but you know <clears throat> my recommendation on protein is you know I, I do generally feel like people need more i mean i think we've emphasized the other macronutrients uh too aggressively over the last few decades and we we sort of left it behind and for different reasons, but you know, here it is. You know, it's one of the few macronutrients that we're we're actually talking about increasing in the diet instead of you know, retracting it from the diet. So, um, you know, I, I think that you know, for most forty-year-olds, uh, you know, it's difficult to find anybody that doesn't have some kind of specific application, whether it's you know they're trying to lose weight or they're trying to exercise or they're dealing with some kind of you know, medical scenario or something like that, I don't even know what the normal population is anymore. When they go, oh, you know, they're abnormal, they're not part of the general population. Who is? You know, it's just those people, they're, they're actually in the minority now. Because once you start looking at the different buckets of individuals, you know, whether it's, you know, the, you see percentage of people who are trying to lose weight, percentage of people who are dealing with type 2 diabetes, percentage of people who are this age group, uh, who are just beginning exercise, you know, all these different things, all of a sudden you're at like 83, 84% of the adult population. So, you know, you're just talking more protein needs in almost all of those scenarios, just to have a more successful outcome. You know? So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think for 40 year olds who are exercising and so forth, I mean, they're gonna need to be up there, you know, 1.5 to, you know, or more is you know would be you know a good place for them to live and more won't hurt and if more means substituting it for other macronutrients that haven't been serving them well go for it so it won't hurt it could probably only help so give it a whirl sitting around and not real active, then what's the point of eating three or 20 grams of carbs a day? So I was just trying to think of it in, in that, that context. Okay. So, and the last question, since we are by the community, um, reverse diet, recovery diet, you guys is it means, right? What would be the best slow recovery, you know, immediately back to pre-work, you know, pre-show, macros, what, you know, so, yeah, I, I love that question because my thought process on that is a 180 from what it was two years ago. I've completely changed my stance on that. And I used to be, okay, we're going to just slowly increase our calories. We're going to make sure we don't go crazy. And keep in mind, I'm working with people who are very competitive and they, they brutalize themselves in many cases to get incredibly lean. So that's my context in, in answering but here's, the more I thought about it, I thought, you know, that's kind of silly because they're not at a healthy body fat percentage. So in order for them to train optimally, they need to be at an optimal body fat percentage. And it's probably not 4% for a guy, it's probably more like eight or 10 or 12. But my point is, it's not 4%. So what is the harm in getting them to that quicker? And I just thought about it more and more. So long story short, I'm much more aggressive in getting their calories up and getting them back to their baseline where I feel like their body fat's in a good place so that they can train optimally. And the second part was, it just isn't realistic with most people. They get done, 
real hard diet. Man, they want to relax a little bit. They want to have some meals with their friends. And that seems crazy to me to, like, say ultra strict and to not have, you know, your friends and your family. Like, try to have some fun with them. So I'm sure a lot of people, that's probably not their thought process, but mine is to be much more aggressive and get them back to that healthy state as quickly as I can as opposed to dragging them. I was at about between 13 and 1400 calories leading into my show. And Monday, after I cheated and ate my face off for three days, um, I started back on 2100 calories. And I've been able to maintain this week about five pounds over stage weight. Of, I mean, I put on body fat from eating a lot for three days, but I jumped right back to it. And I'm telling you, it's the best thing I've ever done because I haven't had to cheat on my diet thinking I'm, you know, starving still um, and I can fit things into my diet way easier and I'm not wanting to binge eat you know post show binge eat so um, and I've been able to stick to it you know that's the hardest part is after a show being able to stick if you're trying to slowly reverse on 1400 calories yeah, I mean it's so hard to stick to that jump them up and you can actually stick to it better and it's, been, and it's been going really well. I feel so much better. <laughs> she's Instead better. Of to, she's uh, better, I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> I might yeah. eat. Yeah. So. so I've actually received criticism over this because of the book that I wrote talked about adding 10 to 15 to 20 to 25 carbs a week. However, the people criticizing me didn't completely read the book. The reason why I advocate adding small amounts is only under one circumstance. Most people, when they come off a harsh diet, are cheating and they're adding food outside of the diet. So that's why I'm an advocate of if you're cheating a lot on the diet post show and you're having a problem, you don't want to go to 2200 calories and then still cheat three, four nights a week because you're going to rapidly gain fat. That's why if, if she was doing that left and right, yeah, she would have to walk her calories up slow because she'd be trying to offset that. And that for the reality of most people that have dieted for a show, you're going to struggle post show for a few weeks or a month or two so being able to just add a ton of calories you can try it and she's doing it great because now you're not eating your face off because you literally jumped your calories up but if you're somebody that's doing both at the same time welcome to fat game like a motherfucker and you're going to eat. so it literally that's why this comes back to coaching as an art form that's why if you're working with clients you have to give that feedback hey I email my clients all the time on a scale one to ten how are you doing on the diet if I see their weight going up and they tell me, hey, I'm a seven, I, I had some extra food at a, at a wedding and here and there. Well, I know I'm not gonna be able to add as much food that week as normal. So you have to get that feedback or self-awareness if you're doing it yourself. And it depends on if it's a competitor or a, non, a regular client too. Mm -hmm. You know, competitors for me, I, don't, I didn't want to stay that lean because I don't feel good. Um, a regular client, isn't that lean? They're they're just normal body fat. So you probably could stir stuff them up, with, and because they feel okay, you know what I mean. Does that make sense? What, what, one other final thing. Jason Wells is a perfect example. Down almost two hundred pounds. We talked about him today. Sometimes when people have a lot to lose, we dieted for a year. I dieted you down to maybe twenty five hundred calories, right? And you're dropping. And it was time to give his body a break from being in a deficit. So we actually reverse dieted up very, very slowly, but he stuck to it perfect, and he continued, would you drop another 20 pounds? Yeah. We went from 2,500 2, calories to 3,000, his met metabolic rate started to speed up, and he didn't cheat, like not one time, and he dropped another 20 pounds, raising calories. Now that's some uniform shit, right? <laughs> Shitting ice cream over here. But in reality, you have to think about that too. Like there is a time to raise it real slow, because Jason needed to lose another 40 or 50 is what we were working on at that point. So it's not always just about coming off show prep, it's about what's the next step. Yeah, so I guess I have a question for everybody in here. Um, I was all competed in a bodybuilding competition before. Okay. Who's competed just one time? And was your, I guess, um, your reverse diet, was that good or? Well, I just know what you're so, if you, so raise your hand. If you reverse dieted perfect after your first show, raise your hand. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> I, 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 
I'm still working your reverse and reverse dieting up your ass. Even there was no reverse dieting. It was just you go in the early 2000s, reverse diet. I mean, I'm sure people were doing it, right? But back then, you just binged. A lot of pressure did after their show. So there was no reverse diet. That is 100% true. So <laughs> I, I got to tell some stories. Just listen. So after I went to Mr. Iowa in the 90s, there's a road called Morse Road by my house, and it's nothing but fast food restaurants. All right? So you go to Pizza Hut, you eat as much as you can, you sit, you got to go to the bathroom, you go to the bathroom, you go to Friendly's, eat as much ice cream as you can. So I just started dating with my current wife now. So she saw me like, uh, you know, like uh, a couple days before the show and I weighed X amount. And then she saw me Wednesday, four days after the show, plus 30 pounds. So I go, I pick her up for lunch, my nose starts bleeding. She's like, what is wrong with you? What happened? But I'm gonna tell you, that in the 90s, man, that's what we did. We would just pig out. It was crazy. So don't do that. <laughs> so yeah, I would say, so this was my first season um, this year, and I would say it was very successful, but my reverse diet was not. Um, so I'm curious to know what percentage of your first time competitors have a very hard time uh, reverse dieting? All of them. 100%. 100% of them. Uh, uh, to add to that, what are some interventions that you use for your clients that have one binge day that turns into two binge days that turns into three, and they are on that rapid fat loss gain? What are interventions that you use with your clients? <laughs> so, I, um, Brad and I were talking about this yesterday. Back in the 90s and the 2000s, there was no such thing as cheat meal. Um, now, all of a sudden, people talk a lot about cheat meals and refeed meals. What I do with most of my clients that I think has really helped us a lot, and certainly helped me personally, is you give somebody a cheat meal, you give them a, you know, take your spouse out or go out with your friends, and within reason, enjoy yourself, have a hamburger, you know, have, you know, some ice cream, whatever. You know, if you have, let's say you're eating five times a day, if you have 35 meals in a week and 34 of them are perfect, and then you have that one, I gotta believe you're still gonna do really well. So, what happens is every weekend, these people get something they enjoy. You know, they get to go have their ice cream, but for me it was five guys, burgers and fries. So when the show's over, all the other guys backstage are like, man, I haven't had pizza, you know, three months or four months. I'm like, yeah, I had two pizzas last weekend, it was good. <laughs> you know, um, but after when the show's over, you haven't went that long without something good. So like the cravings aren't nearly as bad. You know, s some people mentally have a hard time with cheat meals, but that's kind of there's some mental things there that are an issue that needs to be dealt with. But I think just intelligently giving people some cheat meals, some time with their family, their spouse, and things like that, and their friends, I think it pays dividends after the show because they don't feel nearly as you know, desperate for something. Um, flexible dieting. That has been the biggest savior for me and for my clients. Um, because if you're craving something, you can make something fit, you know, into your diet. And I mean, literally, that's been the biggest thing that I've ever done. And then also jumping your calories right back up. You know, going, if you're at 1100, at the end of show prep and whatever you were when you started, jump them straight back up. Because then you're not so hungry and you can fit different foods into your diet um, and still you kind of soothe those cravings without binge eating, if that makes sense. And fit, yeah, fit stuff in. Yeah, and then finally, sometimes you just have to tell them it's coming. I'm like, listen, <laughs> you've been in a deficit. I mean, here's the thing. Sometimes they just need to understand it's going to happen and that they just need to be honest with you as a coach and say, listen, this is coming. You're going to be in the fucking cabinet at 2 in the morning. And you're going to email me tomorrow and be like, coach, I'm sorry. Because it's, it's the more you restrict yourself from something feeling full, the more you're going to have that backlash mentally on the other end. So sometimes they just need to get through it. Like, you just need, they need to experience it. They need to feel fat and fucking gross. You know what I mean? And then they understand why they don't want to feel like that. But to try and avoid it sometimes to me creates an even bigger problem when they just need to 
We jump calories right back up or understand that it's happening. But flexible dieting, it, we're not talking about flexible dieting like go to Domino's two weeks out and like nothing wrong with that because John has been doing that. But I'm saying we're not telling our clients they can go eat whatever they want. It fits it, your macros, bro. We're just saying like she makes stuff. She makes pizzas at home and she counts. She's very, very specific in a bodybuilding sense. But that's sage. I mean, you're eating the most hated word in bodybuilding is pop tarts. You're having pop tarts post workout, but mentally, you were good. So she didn't really struggle much. But I think the thing people struggle with more than the food if they're using flexible dieting is that feeling of being full. Because there's just no way to get around that when you're getting that lean. And I remember you saying in Pittsburgh, you're like, I just want to fucking feel full again. I don't care if it's a salad, vegetables, whatever. I just want to be able to eat and not be starving or lay in bed knowing I'm done for the day. I can't eat again. If I'm going to go eat, I can. We got time for probably about three more. Okay, um, so you got a client, they're 10 weeks out, they look good. You're like, okay, let's do this. We're gonna get you ready for a show. So for who it applies to, what findings have you found over the years that have established you as a coach in the business that you found that you absolutely need your client to do this to be successful on stage? And I know this is a broad question, but something that you have found or a couple of things that you have found that are so very important, like, yes, you have to do this. Um, yeah. uh, I, immediately what jumps to my head is the consistency in uh, check-ins. So a client has to check in the same time, the same lighting every week. When they just start, I start to do it, I start to really struggle as a coach when I get random pictures from the gym. Hey John, I think I'm looking good, what do you think? Dude, you're wearing a sweatshirt. <laughs> you know, but when people are, like, the people that I've coached this year that have done the best are the ones that are absolute machines with their check-ins. Same lighting, because then as a coach, you can see much better what's truly wrong. But when they're in different times of the week, different times of the day, then you're like, you know, if somebody sends you morning check-ins, and all of a sudden they send you an evening check-in, and they look a little more watery, and they're two or three pounds heavier. Okay, well, that's normal throughout the course of the day. So, but that consistency really helps coaches. It really helps us. And when I get a client that won't do that, which doesn't happen very often because I'm very picky, but I would just tell them, like, this isn't going to work. Like, you can't do that. We're not going to be successful. Now I'm just throwing darts and just hoping it, it hits something. So that's one thing. So John, you actually made a great post on Facebook, I think it was about three or four weeks ago, that said you actually looked back at your clients that have done the best over the years, and they're always the people that are checking it on time, you're not having to chase them around, they're sending the good check-in pictures, and they follow everything, versus other clients that sometimes they're just kind of random, and they're emailing you on Sunday at 11 o'clock, or just random stuff, and they don't send pictures for three weeks, and they're, you know, those kind of people don't necessarily get as lean. It just seems to be a good correlation. And I, def I read that and I was like, man, you nailed it on the head. So I know I've got clients that are watching Facebook Live right now. They're emailing me randomly and I'm trying to chase them. And those people, I struggle to get them lean sometimes. And I think because they're just not, if they're struggling with the easiest things, check in the pictures on certain days and times, not something hard to ask for. I think that's one thing that, that's the easiest thing to control. So if they can't fucking do that, and what's her diet look like? What's her training look like? Like how is her meal prep and planning looking like? They can't even send stuff on time. Um, so I, I just want to mention that post was important. I know for me, the most single most successful thing that I do that helps me get someone to stage is I will not take someone on without making sure they're properly set up to do a diet to get on stage. I'm not gonna just take somebody that comes to me 10 weeks out and not know their calories and not know prior history. So I actually prefer to work with somebody for a year so I can do their off season and then we start their prep and I can prime metabolism and get their calories up. We can get used to back and forth communication with emails and things like that and check-ins. And then when it's time to diet, you know, for 20 weeks out, I'm like, all right, we're going to start 20 weeks out. We're going to aim for one, 1 1.5 to 2 pounds a week loss, kind of like you and I are doing. And we set it up that way. 
I just won't randomly take people on because our, our clients place well, right? It's not an ego thing, but they place well because we set it up on the back end. I, I will not take somebody on that I know I can't get them shredded for stage because then it looks like I can't do my job. And I don't want to take someone's money if I can't do it. They just only lose 10 pounds on stage, but fuck, I just wasted their time. I'd rather be honest with somebody. So pre-planning and screening is the most important thing I do, hands down. Dieting and all that stuff's important, but it all goes out the window if you're not set up correctly on the back end. I think training intensity is really important too for to watch because as you get closer into your show, your training intensity just kind of automatically goes down because your energy is low. But um, if you can have them maintain their training intensity the whole entire prep, that will help a lot because you won't have to start adding in more and more cardio just to make up for them not training as intense as they were at the beginning. Sleep. It's 
very, very underrated. And there is all kinds of research out there that shows sleep deprivation has poor effects on insulin sensitivity, that people overeat because they have these leptin and ghrelin imbalances from it. So um, that split shift stuff always worries me, the sleep aspects. So we just encourage you to try to really get educated on sleep and how to get quality sleep, because I think it's going to be very, very important for you.
maximize protein synthesis, but the upper confidence interval, which basically, in short course, if you keep running studies over 95% of the time, you're gonna get certain values within a range, is 2.2. So to me, you always wanna err on a higher side because you don't know where you're gonna be. And if you look at the individual curves, they're always different. So there's really no downside to taking in more, but beyond a certain point, you're not gonna keep getting more protein synthesis. So it's gonna max out, and that is gonna be probably somewhere less than 2.2, maybe 2.0, 1.8, somewhere in there. Uh, so what do you do? Well, there certainly is gonna be vari variability as far as, var as the variables, variability in the variables, meaning repetition range, frequency, volume. You wanna maximize or, or optimize that for the individual because people have different recovery rates. It's not like elderly is not a, a profile of a person. It's, it's at a chronological age, but I know people who are 70 that are in vastly different shape from one another. You know, so your chronic diseases are gonna enter into it. Chronic inflammation is a big uh, aspect. So elderly people tend to have much more chronic inflammatory issues, which actually makes it, has a negative effect on your ability to build muscle. Reducing chronic inflammation loss would be an important thing. Um, but it does come down to ultimately, uh, hormonally there are gonna be issues. So a woman, talked before, estrogen is an anabolic hormone. You go through menopause, you're gonna have issues. Men, testosterone is gonna decline over time. Do you wanna take TRT therapy or estrogen therapy? Those are personal choices that I can't, you know, can't comment on. It's what that is up to the individual. But here's one thing I will say. Uh, some real interesting research shows that there's something called satellite cells. And satellite cells, the short course, they are um, unspecialized cells. They're stem cells, basically muscle stem cells that become their quiescent, they don't do anything until they are woken up, either through muscle damage or primarily through contractions or combinations of such. Once they are woken up, they, they serve as repair factors and they fuse to the muscle cells and they donate nuclei. And nuclei are what produces proteins. It's the transcription of proteins comes through the nuclei. The more, think of it like little factories. The more factories you have, the more proteins you can produce. What's really interesting, it's been shown that you have a greater capacity to produce these and to proliferate, to increase these satellite cells earlier in life. So the earlier you start training, at least theoretically, you do retain these satellite cells and thus the nuclei over time. So this is the hypothetical, this is at least where we're going now through the research. The earlier you can start people on training, the more potential they're gonna have to avoid sarcopenia later in life. Uh, the muscle does have memory, the muscle memory, so even if you stop, you still would have greater ability to gain more later in life. So that's kind of the short course for that community. Yeah, I guess I'll just layer just a tiny bit. I mean, the, um, the best course of action is, is not to wait until somebody is of an advanced age. I mean, we just need to get people active and mechanically stimulating the muscle at an earlier age and build a lifestyle. And I think what's really fun and interesting is, is you know, some of the work that's being done by Brad and others, we're kind of reshaping how people can train. You know, I mean, we're so far removed from, you know, we were talking about how long we've been training. And, you know, I got my first weight set when I was you know, 14. It was concrete filled plastic from Sears. <laughs> and it was awesome. Um, but, you know, and we've come such a long way. But back then, there was, you know, just, there was a very tight way in which you trained. You know, the timing of the movement is very controlled and so forth and so on. It's much more dynamic now. You can manipulate load. There's so many other ways to get people involved. If we can get them involved earlier on, you know, and sarcopenia becomes a little bit less of an issue. The two principal, the two principal and most controllable factors in all of this is going to be the mechanical stimulus of the muscle through resistance training and diet. Primarily, you know, with the, the stimulus of the protein, the two are going to go, you know, sort of hand in hand. And I think what, what a lot of the research is kind of telling us is that if you start late in life, it just takes more protein to get the same type of response to exercise as well as the same type of response to get to protein itself. But if you are somebody who is a lifestyle trained individual throughout decades leading up to that point, you are in a much better advantage than, you know, so it's, I, I just, you know, it makes me a little bit sad that, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, people who are 60 and getting them active and getting them training and so forth and so on. You know, so the best, it really is preventative medicine. If we can get them active and training, 
you know, uh, and finding a comfort level in training and, in, you know, just some and maybe progress that into more, you know, I, I think we're just going to be doing, I mean, those are the, the best prevention tools we've got. On the last one, okay. So um, I know we fine tune as athletes and nutrient timing and meal timing and everything. Lately, I've noticed that I've gotten lazier with my meal prep. So literally, my proteins are chicken and some egg whites, and that's it. What's your feedback on the importance of a variety of protein, not just like from a supplementation standpoint, but eating turkey and chicken and fish as opposed to just eating chicken all the time? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll start. You know, and, and so um, and from, a, from like an amino acid standpoint, you know, proteins may be a little bit different uh, in amino acid composition, and some of that just sort of gets washed out when you eat more of it. Um, but, you know, when you look at something like fish versus chicken, there are some inherent differences between, because now you start talking about sort of those collateral nutrients, which, which may also be provided. So I think some of it's, you know, some of it's like that. And I think we all get into sort of these, food choice ruts where it's like oh, chicken again but you know it's you wake up and you're like oh I gotta make my chicken and it's you just kind of go that way um, I don't I don't know if, it, if it's if there's an issue with it or, or whatever I mean we always talk about variety and so forth I just think with different different protein sources there are some collateral benefits from other nutrients that may be coming along for the ride whether they're omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids that you might get in fish or you know, there's there's certainly some creatine. There's you know, there's other nutrients that are inherent to certain protein sources that you know are attractive as well. So you know, by getting a little overly tight in some of your sourcing, um, you might be sort of weeding out some of the other. You know, because that's the thing. I mean, if, if you eat, uh, it's just targeting animals. You know, and I'm always just fascinated by the other amino acids that you find in animal foods or amino acids like you know the carnitines and the creatines and the beta alanines and so forth that are there too you know and they're not proteogenic you know they're not going to be used for building protein but they serve they serve you know us just like they serve the animal in other capacities so I, I think about you know all those ancillary other nutrients as well and I think that's maybe the beauty of a variety uh, to add on to that, so I really concur with Rob. I, I think um, with maybe just some fine differences that it's kind of cool to look at the different proteins, like Rob talked about whey protein and its digestibility rate versus casein. In practical, in my humble opinion, from a practical standpoint, when you're at your 2.0 per grams per kilogram, 2.2, if you're taking in chicken, which is a complete protein, amino acids or amino acids, you're getting so the digestion, you also, when we're looking at whey digestibility versus casein, if you're just taking whey, who here just all day just has whey or just has casein? So, hopefully no one. It comes down to that's cool lab study, but it's a sterile environment that doesn't really tell us about real life or ecological validity. So my comment to that from a protein muscle building standpoint, just from a protein amino acid standpoint, really it doesn't matter. But as Rob said, the issue then becomes from other nutraceuticals, if you will, uh, <coughs> nutrients and nutraceuticals that are obtained through food and through other sources can be very anabolic or potentially additive from an anabolic standpoint. Rob mentioned omega-3s. I'm actually just collaborating on our a review paper on omega-3s and their potential ability to enhance anabolism, uh, sensitivity, signaling sensitiv sensitivity, and other factors. And there's other uh, factors as well. So you have to look at the totality of your diet, not just looking at chicken. What else are you eating? Are you taking in a lot of flax or fish oil capsules, which might offset that, or then if not, you need to take in salmon and other fishes that do encompass that. So looking at your total nutritional profile rather than just isolating on the protein source would be my own recommendation. Um. 100% agree, and you know, I would add two things. Um, Dr. Serrano is a real big believer. He's a, one of my mentors in rotating foods on occasion to avoid food uh, insensitivity. We see that with chicken a lot. We see with egg whites a lot. When you just eat the same thing over and over and over and over and over, you start to have some issues digesting it. So just from that standpoint, um, I would just add that as well. It's good to have some variety. You know, you don't see people with scurvy and pellagra, and, you know, berry berry and rickets and all that stuff. Um, but I still think variety is, is, a, is a good thing. So. Okay, so.
so, first of all, let's give a round of applause to our two more